will be the next meeting for growth of natural resources. Um, that will be in the chamber from two, I mean, from four to six. The one after that is October 30th. Um, so the first case up today is um, Z23 um, TC119 Spring Forest Road. Mark. Good afternoon. This is a TCZ1-19. The address for the property is 5001 Spring Forest Road. This is a text change to amend the conditions associated with zoning case uh, Z4708. Um, this request was reviewed by the Planning Commission and has um, been unanimously recommended for approval and it did go before the City Council. Uh, I think it was um, in last month. Uh, again, the address is 5001 Spring Forest Road. Uh, you can see here from the map that it, it borders uh, Spring Forest Road and, and Lewisburg Road. There are 19 uh, zoning conditions that currently govern the two associated properties. These conditions uh, generally regulate the use, uh, lighting, landscaping, density, building materials, buffers, building height, uh, transit amenities, vehicular access, hours of operation in general, and uh, trip generation amounts. The petitioner is requesting to modify the zoning conditions for the 11.2 uh, acre property, which is, the, uh, which is zone CX3PK uh, and is located on the north side of Spring Forest Road. Uh, the other uh, lot that's associated with this development, which is uh, mainly on, uh, on Lewisburg Road, is not part of this application. At the, uh, the council meeting, there were uh, several concerns that were identified. Uh, those would be the proposed buffer, uh, what it would look like and how much of the existing tree line will be uh, included or remain, uh, the proposed number of housing units and the, the, how the, the term reasonable number of units is being defined, the, uh, the placement of the buildings on the site and the existing driveway and existing building that are located to the west of the subject property. Um, unless uh, the committee has any uh, questions of staff, the applicant is here today to address these concerns. There, there is one more condition I see listed on this sheet that we just received. It says removed condition that limited development with the 2009 traffic study. I was wondering what that was all about. So Mr. Cox, just just to while you're looking for that, Mark, I just, this is one of the things that um, planning has been talking about do, issuing for us when we have uh, substance changes so we can see the things that are being removed and the things that are being asked for. So this is a bridge to sort of help us with that. So I think that's helpful. Um, Mark, can you answer? I think it's number 11. 10, actually. 10, I'm sorry. since we have a full Yeah, plate. I'm not seeing okay. that. Hold on. Yes, sir. So the, the summary sheet you have in front of you just is a synopsis of which conditions have been added, which have been modified, which have been removed. Councilmember Cox, the condition that you're referring to is a condition that the applicants are proposing to remove, right. uh, which tied limits of development to a traffic study that was produced at time of the rezoning in 2008. Okay. Um, and it, that might be a good question to ask the applicants why the, that condition is not retained. My assumption would be it's because the development that's um, envisioned here is, is much different than what was envisioned in 2008 with the rezoning. Do we have any data on what that traffic study entailed? Um, not at this meeting today, but again, that's a good question for the applicant. Well, we must have that information. Yes, sir. We have it in our historical files. That's correct. Because obviously, if anyone wanted to build something there, we would have to conform to that condition. Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Was that condition based on 
Travis, was that condition based on what was originally proposed there, which was for retail? That's correct. It was produced at the time of the rezoning back in 2008 and 2009. Um, and at that time, the property was rezoned for a portion of residential, which has already been constructed, about 300 units. Mm -hmm. And then the remainder, which is what we're talking about today, uh, which was envisioned for retail. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So what I might do, Mark, is just have the applicant come up first. Thank you. Molly Stewart, Morningstar Law Group. Did you want to begin by addressing the question regarding... Why don't you answer Mr. Cox's question first, and then do you have a presentation that you want to do? I, I do have a couple of updates since our last meeting, okay. certainly. Um, so as far as that traffic study condition that was in, uh, in the existing conditions, uh, there were a couple of reasons that came out, primarily that it doesn't address the proposed use. Um, but also, um, the way that condition is written, it's, it's very unclear how uh, we can maintain it or enforce it. Um, if there's sort of ongoing monitoring of traffic on the site, something like that. So we wanted um, just clarity as far as, as what can happen. And um, as a development proposal, uh, we didn't want to get into that kind of daily operations. Um, and uh, since the, the time of that zoning condition, uh, the UDO has come into effect, and Section 8.2.2 um, provides that adequate streets must be provided for the traffic generated. Um, so we felt that that covered the concept and in the kind of updated UDO a method. Okay, I would like to see the language of that condition though. We'll get that. So what we might do is let Molly make whatever uh, presentation she wants to make and then we can ask our questions. Okay. When, when you say you want to see the language of the condition, you mean the actual zoning conditions mm -hmm. that apply today? No, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can get that. Good. Um, and so I, I do have some slides if, if that may be helpful if there are questions. Um, but fundamentally, uh, we, we have gone back to the drawing board and specifically Ken Thompson, our designer, has, has put in a lot of work to, to try to address the concerns. Um, and, and number one, we heard that there was a concern about the number of units. And we've been able to refine that a bit. We hadn't really gone into site planning, and so we hadn't really talked about that previously. Um, now we're looking at a, a limit of 200 units, and that's something that we are willing to add to a, to a zoning condition. So that's one update that we have for you. Uh, the other request we heard was specifically about the buffer. Um, I think the main concern was on the west side, but, but generally speaking, the, the buffer. Um, and so we looked at that one more time, and. Uh, learned that we are able to offer a, a 100 foot total buffer to the buildings um, from the property line um, where there is a neighborhood transition today. We had previously increased that neighborhood transition and now we're increasing it um, further so that the first 70 feet would be a landscaped buffer and the additional 30 feet um, would be that zone B neighborhood transition allowing for um, dry vials, fire access, that kind of thing. So you're saying that total that total condition would be 100 feet? It would be 100 feet total to the buildings. Um, okay. How much, Molly, I know that you've talked about you, you retaining the ability to do retail. How much retail are you guys thinking about? My understanding is there's no plan for retail. Um, maintaining the condition of the limited hours of operation of retail uses? We have maintained that condition um, just because it's in the existing conditions and it's not, um, it doesn't cause any issue with our proposal. Okay. No retail. Other questions? Um, as far as the fencing materials are concerned, what, what are the fencing materials that you would be maintaining the condition for? One moment, getting to that condition. We are um, leaving the current condition in place, which reads that they may consist of a mix of materials, including but not limited to um, brick, metal, PVC pipe, and wood. And what about building materials? The current, um, the current conditions have a restriction on uh, residential building facade materials that we would be maintaining. And that condition requires a mix of brick slash masonry, cementitious material, and Miratech or or hardy material, 
um, residential facades, well, that's, this relates to single family homes, um, and, and also vinyl siding is prohibited, prohibited on residential buildings. Okay, and what is the, um, the height condition? The requested zoning would, would limit us to the three stories. Three stories, okay, there wasn't a um, condition that, in terms of feet. That's right. Okay. Need to, it's under the seven. Okay. Well, this was under the old code, so I didn't know if there was a condition. Okay. Molly, there isn't a condition other than it's three stories. Correct. Um, any other questions? Molly, do you have every, you want to, any more information you want to share with us? Um. I can provide an update on the driveway. That was another question that had been asked. Sure. sure. Um, let's see, I have slides on that. Well, I can answer what was done on the first phase with that, if you want. Um, you have more yeah. update. Oh, Ken Thompson, our designer, has more updates uh, regarding the uh, traffic condition. If you'd like to hear his response. In development um, along uh, 401, when we did that project, because we had dual accesses, one on 401 and one on Spring Forest, we were required to make all the improvements in that traffic study at that time. So the whole frontage, it was not a phased implementation. It was a full front, full implementation with the initial phase. So with respect to the existing driveway, um, this is just a, a little bit of a summary. It, um, really becomes a more of a site plan issue. But here's the aerial from two, 2011, and you can see that that kind of a two-leg driveway leads back uh, to that house in the rear. Um, by 2013, there was some work done on this property, um, and it looks like that uh, the eastern, uh, eastern access of the driveway uh, fell into disuse, um, and even further by 2018. Uh, you do still see a driveway there right along the property line that exists today. Um, back to the condition. Um, so in, in any event, it, it does look like um, the, the driveway that was more on this parcel is not in use today, um, while there may be one along the property line. Okay, so is there access to that property from some other way? The property has frontage on, I believe it's Old Elizabeth Road to the, to the rear there. But is there a driveway? There's there? not a driveway. So if they needed to get in there with a vehicle, this is the only driveway they have? As far as we know, that's right. Okay. So they would have to put a driveway in. Mm -hmm. That's right. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Molly. Thank you. So I do think there's uh, members from the area here, so um, if you would all who want to speak come to the front, that would be, that would be good. Be helpful. Just one of you? I guess. Okay. Please state your name and address for the clerk, please. I'll get this thing out of the way because <laughs> I'm scared of it. Uh, <laughs> my name's Phil Collins, and I live at 4908 Elaine Avenue. And the property is in Willardine Acres. Hold on just a minute. I don't think his mic is working. Thank you, Robert. Let's make. Yeah, that one's working. Thank Is you, that sir. good? Is that yeah. Try it. Is that good? Can you hear in the back, back there? Can y'all hear him? Can y'all hear? <laughs> Let's wait just one second. Sorry, technical situation. This is when we need a song and dance or something. <laughs> <laughs> a song and dance show here. Oh, I'll do that right now. Thank you. I thought about it a while ago. So, um, Mr. Thompson is excused, absent and excused, and Mr. Stevenson is also. But if he gets out of his meeting in time for Go Triangle, he will make it here. But he's excused. Thank you. Got it. Try the other one. Got it. That may have it. 
Let's see. Let's try it, sir. Zach got it. Y'all can hear him? Okay. We're good to go now. Good Thank to go. you so much. Okay. My name is Phil Collins, and I live at 4908 Elaine Avenue in Willardine Acres. Willardine adjoins this property on the back side all the way around. Back in 08, the Sandman family in Raleigh purchased this piece of property, and it was in, sh in the shape of kind of an inverted L, if you think the long side was on 401 and the short side going up on the corner there on Spring Forest. Now, the total property was zoned for apartments. So they came before the city council and wanted to rezone. And what they wanted to do was take the 13, it was, I think it was 24.65 acres in the total tract of land. They wanted to take all the apartments that was on the whole tract of land and move it up on the 13 acres that faces 401 on Lewisburg Road. So they were able to do that, which left, and by doing that, they wanted four-story buildings, which from Willardine's side, it appears to be a five-story building because of the basement under it and the topo of the land goes down. So the people that live in Willardine are able to sit on their back porch and look at five stories right behind them, which, you know, is... It's not good. But anyway, the Sandman family agreed to give us a 100-foot buffer. And at that time, they wanted to try to join that piece of property with Old Elizabeth Road. So they agreed to block that off, and the city council went along with that. And so there was no entrance to that piece of property from Willardine Acres. Now, the Sandman family, or Andy Sandman, still owns that piece of property that these people want to rezone. I uh, don't think he's here. Uh, DHIC, which is a good company, uh, they are the ones that are trying to get it rezoned. That I don't understand since the owner's not trying to get it rezoned. I just don't understand all that. But in any event, DHIC, right up the road from us, on spring, on Spring Forest, owns Avonlea, which is the same type of apartments that they want to put right here. Right across the street from Willardeen, Evergreen Construction Company is building 42 units, and they are also the same type apartments. And I asked them, I called them and asked them, were they the owners? They said, yes. I said, how many units are y'all building right there? They said, 42. I said, are they affordable housing units? Yes. This is right across the street from where these folks want to build more affordable housing units backing up to our neighborhood again. I said, what kind of rents you charge over there? The lady said it'd be, be, be between $475 and $675 for one bedroom and $550 to $750 for a two bedroom. I guess that depends on your income or what type of job you have. But I moved out there in 1967 as well as some of my neighbors. Those pe a lot of the people there that back up to this piece of property have been there since 1970. Now, we know there's got to be changes. We know that. But when the Sandwins convinced the city council that they were going to move all the apartments up here in one section, in order to do that, they made a seven, uh, I mean, excuse me, a four-story apartment building with the basement. They even came back later and tried to get the basement apartments and that was turned down thank goodness but in any event they had a big screen they didn't this council room didn't have all these TVs they had a big old screen right here and so they put up a a nice pretty architectural picture of that corner piece of property that these folks are trying to rezone now and what they were showing was two-story brick buildings and Michael, Michael, Michael. Anyway, he was the he was the lawyer for for uh, Andy Sandman. 
Michael Birch. He was with K&L Gates LLP. And he had an architectural drawing of these buildings and said that they would probably be putting in office buildings, doctor's office buildings, and possibly a pharmacy on that corner. Mr. Sandman came up and said the reason they didn't want to use the whole thing for apartments was because the piece that's on the corner that of Lewisburg and Spring Forest and comes a little way up Spring Forest, that that was worth too much money to put apartments on. Now we turn around now and now they want to put apartments on it and put affordable housing units on it. Right up the road from us, Avonlea sits there. Right across number one, they got Trio, which is 300 apartments. It's going for us old age apartments. Closer to us on the right hand side of the road is Meadow Apartments. They are the same type units. They are affordable housing unit rentals. Now these folks want to put affordable housing units next to us, right across the road where we come out of our neighborhood. There sits 42 new ones that's going up. And it just looks like we're getting inundated and squeezed by all the apartments. Now I know that, you know, we got to have growth. But we don't have bus service out there. And it looks like to me that the old folks in the city of Raleigh, which I grew up, I don't know if y'all did or not, but I grew up on 409 North Boylan Avenue from a baby. You know, it looks like to me that the old folks in the city of Raleigh, they want to live in Raleigh. They don't want to be moved way out on 401 North, which is what it appears that this, sort of, this facility would do. We would like to request as a neighborhood, and I'm sorry we don't have more, we probably don't have maybe 10 or 15 people here maybe, but a lot of our people are working every day, so they can't get off work at this time of day. But we would like to request that it, it remain as it's zoned because they was given to them one time, the city council gave it to them one time, and why in the world they asked that that it be zoned co like commercial, and that's what the city council went along with. And now, the owner's not here; he's not requesting it. So you would rather, sir, you would rather have a gas station there because it could be zoned. I mean, it's zoned where you could have a gas station. Yeah, there could be a gas station down on the corner. It certainly could. Mm -hmm. You would rather have a gas station. Yes, ma'am. Than affordable units. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And the reason I say that, Ms. Crowder, is because all of the apartment complexes up Spring Forest Road, up 401 on Danzy Drive, you need to ride through those apartment complexes. Nothing against people, but you should see what we have surrounding us now. A yeah. A gas station on that corner would not bother us nearly as bad as what we suspect may come there. Now we know that the 55 plus age group apartments, we know what that calls for, but just yesterday, I'm up there on the corner at the school by DHIC's Avonlea Apartments. And they're all out there in the parking lot playing. They're not 55 years old. Now, I realize that maybe the one that rents the apartment may be 55 plus. But some of the people in those apartments are not 55. And if you see the pickup trucks that are in there with the different signs on the side of them, we had just soon to have a gas station. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to speak? Hi, Ms. Crowder and Council. My name is Merle Seastrom. I actually just purchased the property in Willow Dean in uh, May of 2019. So I'm a new resident and actually bought it from the original family. 
So my big concern is there is that Spring Forest is actually a one lane road. Now it opens up into three lanes as it becomes a signal and it turns into Spring, and it hits uh, uh, Highway 1 or 401, sorry, Lewisburg. And uh, my big concern is the traffic primarily because it already takes us about, sometimes you'll sit there for 30, 45 seconds coming out of Willow Dean. So I can't speak, you know, so I'm a little bit new to this whole process and learning a little about what's going on in the environment. Coming from a, uh, a low income family myself, I can't speak against that income piece. But really my concern is the traffic because it is a main thoroughfare between Capitol and um, some of the rest of the Northeast Raleigh area. I can't think where all those dealerships are on Capitol on that. On that. So still, again, still learning the area, but really that's my big concern. And then at, at, at zero, 5008 Lane, I actually do back up partially to where the new development is, up, is looking to. And I, I concur with liking to keep the zoning as it is, because I'd rather see the gas station as a lower traffic and B is uh, a gas station doesn't rise up three stories. So that's just where my share, the share my thoughts on why we'd like to keep the zoning. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Can you give me your address one more time? 5008 okay. Elaine Avenue. If that's, does anybody else wish to speak? Thank you. We'll bring it back to the table. Mr. Cox. Yes. Um, I understand staff, well, I remember staff uh, provided a report recent, not too long ago, uh, about a couple things. Um, one is that we have, we do have a policy as far as uh, affordable housing is concerned uh, in terms of how close they, sh they can be. Uh, to each other a scatter policy I believe we, we refer to it or is a location policy and I was wondering if staff could speak to that I do don't have any, believe we have, have anybody, anybody here housing? from housing and neighborhoods Larry's, Larry's uh, oh Larry's here hello Larry hey Larry Jarvis we do have an affordable housing location policy and what it speaks to is supporting additional affordable housing in areas that have concentrations of low-income uh, residents, minority residents, existing concentrations of affordable housing. <clears throat> Elderly housing, which I think is proposed here, is exempt from that policy. It only applies to new family projects. Okay, but, but it, let's assume for the sake of argument this, this isn't uh, senior housing. Actually, it's only 80 percent, but in any case. Um, so if it, this were not senior housing, would we, would that policy come into play? <clears throat> if it was proposed as affordable housing and it was going to be family units, uh, the policy would come into play and council would need to grant a waiver to the policy w at that point in time that we came before you and re recommended or didn't recommend, did recommend uh, local funding for the project. Okay, and, and because there is a condition that requires 80% of the units to be occupied by one person 55 and older, but that implies that 20%, that which would be, what, 50 units, um, would be regular right. f family. I'll let uh, <coughs> some from DHIC reply, uh, re respond to that. My understanding is that when it's uh, 55 and above, uh, the other 20% have to be disabled households. Is that not correct? 62 and above has got to be, everyone is 62 and above. When you're senior and it's 55, I believe that it's 55 and above or disabled. Okay. Molly, were you going to speak, or someone was going to speak to that from DHSE? Hi, I'm Natalie Britt, Vice President for Real Estate Development at DHIC. Hi, Natalie. Hi. And can, you give your the, can you give your address to the clerk, please? Sorry. 305 Taylor Street, Raleigh. Um, that 62 or 55 and older is a fair housing definition, and the tax credit program really re encourages all affordable housing developments to target at the 55 age and up, so that's why we, we did that here. And basically it allows for up to 20% being um, a little bit younger, but it doesn't require that. So it really depends on who comes and applies to live there. So it's not like we have to reserve 20% of the units for someone less than 55, but yes, those households are disabled. Okay. And it can't, they can't be below 45 as a head of household. So it's not all the way down the scale. Okay. Thank you. Does that help, Mr. Cox? Did that answer your question? Right, but to, to see if I understand this correctly, you could add a condition that 100% of it would be 55 and older. Is that correct? That or, or doesn't not? satisfy fair housing. That does laws. not. Okay. 
And I just want to clarify also that Avonlea Apartments is a family property, so that's why the gentleman probably saw children there or younger people because that's not an age restricted. That's not age restricted. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Now the other thing that staff reported on was uh, the density in the area, and um, I believe they did it by census track. I don't remember who did that. I believe the report came from Mr. Bowers, um, and there was um, the density on the south side of uh, spring forest and density on the north side of spring forest uh, in terms of the uh, multi the amount of multifamily housing in the area so i believe the census track on the south side if i'm not mistaken was it was greater than 70 percent multifamily housing um i was wondering if you could speak to that ken do you recall that report i mean we're asking that out of the blue so what I can say generally is that there is a census tract whose boundaries are pretty close to 401 US 1 and Spring Forest Road, that triangle. And uh, upon information and memory, I do believe that there's a high multifamily percentage within that tract, but I cannot quote off the top of my head what the specific figure is. Mm -hmm. um, but you can tell just by looking at a land use map or an aerial photograph that there's a number of apartment complexes within that general visit area. Okay. Um, okay, that's the end of my questions, I guess. For now. So discussion at the table. So I, I, I will say to you that we, we talk constantly about the need for affordable housing, whether it's senior or affordable housing in general. I think any time that we have an opportunity to put senior housing affordability that we don't have much of, we should take every advantage of that. DHIC as a partner in the affordable housing is a very good partner to have and does product, good product and quality product. So for me, though, it, though you, there's a lot of apartments in the area, I happen to live in an area where there's a lot of apartments and a lot of affordability all around me and I've never seen it as a burden for where I live um, so I would be um, supportive of the case moving forward yeah I do have one other question sorry I didn't think to ask it before do we um, is there an AMI percentage that we're going for here or, or is that not senior I guess I don't know the answer to that do we have Mr. Jarvis here all of the housing that we do is that's financed with tax credits is 60% of area median or less. And then sometimes there's deeper targeting bands, but okay, this one's thank you. more than that. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, um, I would have to agree that, um, you know, affordable housing, we keep hearing over and over is one of the main concerns of the community. And um, I think if, um, if we can add something here, I think that would make sense. Um. I agree with you. However, I also hear the neighbors that uh, they are suffering from fatigue from all the density. And uh, there currently is a 100 foot buffer as a condition on the property. Mm -hmm. They're so, going to maintain that. No, they're not. They're going to maintain because the current condition is a 100 foot vegetative buffer. And what they're proposing is a 70 foot landscape buffer with a 30 foot available for parking or other. Molly, would you explain uses? that one more time, please? Sure. So this is part of the neighborhood transition, um, which is required at this location. Um, we have expanded the neighborhood transition that would otherwise be required under the UDO so that the zone A, which is the landscaped area, would need to be at least 70 feet wide. Um, and that the zone B, which has very limited uses within it, um, no principal structures, uh, that would be the next 30 feet. So you're only going to do a vegetative um, buffer of 70 feet, and that would include existing vegetation, or you're going to? So we were able to go back and, and add overlay on top of that along the property lines, a, 35 foot um, tree conservation area to the extent there are sufficient trees there now to meet those requirements um, So what what there is to be preserved um, will be preserved there. 
See, what I would like to see is to maintain the current condition, which is a 100-foot vegetated buffer, and, and to provide the neighborhood some relief, really no parking between the houses and, and that buffer, um, so that what they're seeing is not a parking lot from their properties. They would, they would be seeing the buildings, but they would not be seeing the parking lot. Yeah, and that, so I, what I would like to do is ask that you go back and, and think about that. And um, because I really think the neighbors have had longstanding expectations for what this property would become. There's been an enormous amount of growth in that area. All, almost all of it has been multifamily, uh, multi-story apartment buildings. And it really isn't providing a diversity of housing in the area. So Molly. Um, so anything that we can do to provide some relief to the existing single family neighborhood I think is something that we need to um, take a look at. Yeah, I'd like to hear what the what the problem would be with maintaining the hundred foot vegetative buffer. We have buffer. Ken Thompson here who can address um, how how the site is. So I was going to ask the question: Is there a reason why you don't want the hundred foot? Does it make less units available from a buildable standpoint? What what does it impact? I would like to turn that over to Ken. Okay, thanks. Hi, Ken. Hey. Um, it doesn't have an impact on the number of units we can provide. What the scenario we're afraid of is that we have to provide fire access around the building, and these buildings typically tend to be a little longer, and trying to get those hose pulls around the buildings is not always possible. So we're trying to reserve that, that we would be able to get a fire lane so that we could be compliant with the fire code. Well, can you go back and take a look at this and see if you can achieve that while also maintaining this 100-foot buffer? without a, a final building to work with, I would not be able to. So you cannot make that commitment? I can't commit that I can make it a building com, uh, compliant with the fire code. Well, you could if you made, you, you probably could if you made fewer units or a small, or you know, move the building further away. And of course, that probably mean you'd have to build fewer units, but, um, but I would really like to see you commit to the 100 foot vegetative buffer. I don't think that's too much to ask. Uh, of these people. That, that condition has been there uh, for, what, 10 years? And uh, I know there's been a lot of growth but it, and changes, but it hasn't changed that much. And, and given the amount of uh, apartments that are in the area, um, in, to be able to provide that extra 30 feet of relief to uh, these residents, I think is, is worth it in order to be able to build these additional units. Understood. So, um, I'm, I'm going to make a motion that we um, move this from Growth and Natural Resources Committee. We can take a vote. Um, as the conditions that were asked for by Mr. Cox is that everything you have here stays as is, except for making sure that we do a 100-foot buffer on the adjoining, I guess that's the northwest side of the, the property. The west. It's west? West and, and northwest corner. Northwest corner. Um, it's not that it's not all the way around the property, but it's between the, the houses and the and the property. Yeah, and a vegetative buffer, not just right. a buffer. Mm. Okay, so why don't y'all make a motion then? Well, I'll make a motion that we refer this back to city council um, with the provision that um, that they maintain they, that we maintain that they maintain a uh, one hundred foot vegetative buffer on the west and northwest corner between the, the um, existing uh, neighborhood and the property. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, next, 1726-2030 Comprehensive Plan Update, CP2, Economic Prosperity, Equity, Expanding Housing Choices. Good afternoon. Hello. Um, How are you? Hiram Mabel for City Planning. Hello. Uh, I'm just going to give a brief, brief introduction of where we are in the comprehensive plan update overall. Um, so five pieces that are all, or four out of five are moving, hard to keep track of. Um, so 
Letter A is the one that's been approved um, with four chapters. Um, letters B, which is about land use and transportation, and D, which is green print, so the sustainable and environmental chapters. Uh, we're at a public hearing earlier this month and are, will be heard again in November at a work session, probably. I think that date is still somewhat tentative. But um, And then the fifth piece, E, uh, successful, growing successful neighborhoods and communities has its public hearing debut in October, so a couple weeks away. So where we are now um, is this piece, two, CP2C19, containing three chapters, um, economic development and housing are full chapters, and then a, a new insert into the implementation chapter. Um, so again, this was had a public hearing in July, so before the summer break, came back as a special item uh, earlier this month and referred to the, this committee. There were a handful of questions raised at the table um, on the 3rd and then also an email. So there is a, a memo from staff in the backup. Um, hopefully answering those questions, we can, if there are further questions or clarifications or questions about content that the memo does not address, we can certainly go over that. Um, but the presentation today is really focusing on the, the subsection, so the participation um, insert that staff is proposing. There was the question at the table raised by uh, Mr. Stevenson about an APA publication that was recently released, and, and so we're going to focus on that and ask for some guidance. Um, and just as a reminder, there are no particular time limits for comp plan amendments, so no clock. I'm going to hand it over to Jason Harden, who is the primary author of that subsection, to walk us through the presentation. Jason, before you begin, um, guys, Russ is not here. Right. Well, right. It is probably important for him to be part of the conversation. I said, just hold on just a minute. We're just, we'd love to see your presentation, but we're trying to decide um, if it might be better to hold it to the 16th, and I think we could move something around on the 16th day mm -hmm. to include this. You certainly could. Uh, we do have one other item also, so we could defer this, and if Mr. Stevenson joins us later, we could come back, back to this to item yeah. still uh, this afternoon is another alternative. You want to modify your agenda? Yes. All right. Yeah, we'll happy to wait. Yeah, he, he might end up being able to show. If he does, great. If not, we do have something else. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, you're up. Kenny. Hey. Good afternoon. It's going to be a tag team effort between myself and Mr. Lynch. It's a little just, unusual I'm soft-spoken today. So just for people who are here and um, who are going to watch is that we, what we had hoped for was to for you guys to educate us a little bit as we see this coming up more and more and we just wanted to be a little more educated as to what it means and how it affects us and the good it's doing. So um, this is really for educational purposes for all of us. And uh, TJ and I are going to be mindful of your time. This is a very deep topic. We'll dive in as deep as you like, but this is a very high-level presentation. Thank you. And before we begin, we do want to recognize the contributors to our work. Mr. Tim uh, Bromgardner, uh, the director of the North Carolina Division of Mitigation Services, is with us right now. He has to leave in a few minutes, but he's a significant contributor. Much of his work is embedded in this presentation, and we've left the original formatting so you can see where his work is and where our staff contrib uh, contributions are. We've only modified his work slightly to highlight the mitigation aspects of this broad conversation. Then I also want to recognize our city attorney's office, and Engineering Services, Stormwater Division, Wayne Miles and Ben Brown for all of their good work in helping us look this over. Thank you. So we'll begin this conversation where so many of our utility conversations begin around the advent of the Clean Water Act. Uh, this, was the f this is the federal U.S. law that regulates discharge of pollutants into the nation's waters, which includes our lakes, rivers, streams, our estuaries, and coastal areas. It was passed in 1972 and was amended in 77 and 87. 
And there's a lot of important aspects to this law that's fundamental to the business that we, we do every day. But I want to highlight a few areas here for today's conversation. First, the, the law established that it was unlawful to discharge pollutants into navigable waters. Second, it set water quality standards and the means to determine if those standards were violated. And uh, this aspect of cooperative federalism, it also set who was managing that discussion of water quality standards. The states, in our case, have a primacy in North Carolina. And then uh, three, it established this regulatory framework uh, to manage the discharge, dredging, and filling of, of materials into navigable waters. Lots of aspects to the Clean Water Act. We're going to highlight three today. The first is uh, Section 404. Uh, it's managed in policy by EPA, but implemented by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and it establishes a program to regulate the discharge of dredge or fill material into navigable waters. And then there's Section 401, which allows the state who manages the water quality aspects to certify that this discharge or dredge of fill material doesn't violate water quality standards. And then finally, there's Sections 303D and Sections 305B, which identify impaired waters uh, with and without restoration plans which will lead toward a total maximum daily load of a pollutant being established for an impaired water body and a management strategy for that pollutant. All of these are really uh, important to be talking about the topic that we're really uh, tackling today which is mitigation activities otherwise known as ecosystem services or ecosystem commodity markets. And when we're talking about ecosystem services, there's really two sides that we want to, uh, to look at. There's the concept of impact, and then there's the concept of mitigation. Impact is as, as simple as what it sounds like. Um, it could be as simple as uh, introducing a shovel of dirt into a navigable stream, digging into a wetland, or the more traditional end-of-pipe wastewater discharges that we're all familiar with um, after use by our community and others. At a certain level, all of these activities require a permit. Uh, this is the permit threshold. The permit is the regulatory influence that spawns the replacement requirement of lost resources, known as mitigation. As an entity applies for a permit, consideration is given to two types of decisions. The avoidance of the impact to the maximum extent practicable, which is called minimization. Then when you can't avoid it, there is the mitigation of the activity. So who makes this uh, requirement for mitigation? Who does it impact? Well, it, it affects anybody uh, who uh, impacts a resource at a level where permits are, are required. Regulators, in the case the people that are regulating the city, uh, consider the type, amount, and quality of the resource that's impacted, and then a mitigation requirement is established. And we must, we must satisfy those mitigation uh, requirements before a permit is issued. So the other side of the equation, mitigation. There's a lot that can be said here and we've got a lot of slides in the bullpen if you want to dive deep, but in its broadest sense it's really about the impact of the resource, the mitigation requirement, and what we need to do to fulfill our restoration obligations for that resource, generally in the same area. Um, this creates, effectively, a marketable product, a, a what we would call an intangible asset that we could book that is open uh, to marketplaces for trading uh, among permittees. And what are some of these marketable com commodities? Under this concept, it's streams and wetlands. And what we want to highlight in particular for you today is uh, the buffer nutrient aspects uh, that we have some significant obligations coming up in the public utilities realm that we're trying to address. Now under the Clean Water Act, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and state regulatory agencies require mitigation to be performed in one of three ways. We're really focusing on the central concept of mitigation banks. 
which is a, a private, normally a private venture capital approach to finding uh, locations to restore or enhance, preserve or create, thus creating a credit that we can purchase. Uh, in our case, the city of Raleigh is unusual. It's one of three cities in, in North Carolina that is authorized to have its own mitigation bank. So we have a little wider portfolio of choices in front of us. Then there's two other options that we could pursue that's definitely in our portfolio. It's the in lieu fee program again, that Tim manages uh, on behalf of the state. And uh, we could do permittee responsible direct mitigation one for one uh, outside of the banking system. So that is the basic primer of the regulatory framework. And again, we can dive deeper. Mr. Lynch is going to now tell you how this regulatory framework impacts the Public Utilities Department our stormwater program slightly, and uh, what some of our larger expenditures will be coming down the pipe uh, reflect out of this framework. So just to summarize a little bit then, the mitigation banks allow us to uh, uh, build up a bank and uh, of basically areas that we have agreed to protect. And then in exchange for that, we can have disturbing activity in other areas. Is that correct? Fair summary. Okay. Hello. Hello. I'm not quite as soft spoken as Kenny, <laughs> so I'm sure you can hear me just fine. Um, I'm going to take a little deeper dive. I'm going to take you into how this impacts us. Um, and I'm going to start by just a quick overview of the Noose River Basin. Uh, it is the third largest river basin in North Carolina and the only river basin or the largest river basin that is entirely within North Carolina and doesn't affect other states. Uh, it's about 275 miles long, and uh, the lower portion of the of the Noose River Basin uh, is the estuary. It's kind of that lower 50 miles, and uh, a lot of what we're going to be talking about in my slides is what our impact on the estuary is, and not necessarily the river so much, but the estuary. Uh, that's where a lot of the problems occur. Uh, greater than one and a half million people in our basin, and uh, nutrient loading is kind of a is kind of the big issue. Uh, the basin has uh, a lot, the, the Noose River has a lot of good uses, right? So you've got uh, tourism and water supply and recreation, uh, and uh, you can, you recognize one of those uh, there, pictures there, I'm sure. Quite a big fish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Um, but the Noose River does have a history of challenges. Uh, it has. Uh, uh, all the growth, um, all of the nutrients loading on, on the river basin has resulted in uh, algal blooms. It has, uh, uh, we've had issues with fisteria uh, in the basin. Um, and you can see flooding of hog farms, poultry farms, that sort of thing has also caused excess nutrients to get in the basin. And uh, it has caused problems. So when there's problems, um, you know, the, the river gets listed. Uh, the Noose River was listed for, on the 303D list. Uh, that's the bad list uh, for rivers, the creeks, streams, uh, that basically says it's not meeting the water quality standards that, it, that are set for it. Uh, those water quality standards that it wasn't meeting, or actually the standard it wasn't meeting is a chlorophyll A standard. Uh, chlorophyll A is meant, is a, it's really a pigment, but it's meant to be a measurement of algal, uh, algal growth within that water body. Um, so to, to address that 303D, anytime there's a stream listed, there has to be a management strategy for it. Um, there was a noose management strategy that was created for, for managing this problem. Um, and in 1994, the Lower Noose Basin Association, you've heard of the LNBA, you've probably heard us talk about it before, uh, we are a member, uh, was, served, uh, was first formed as a monitoring association just to, to monitor the performance from, uh, you know, of the entire river basin. Um, and it was, it was formed by the dischargers, the point source dischargers within the basin. Um, Can in you identify who those are who do that? I mean, do we know who is, who's loading and who's not into? We, we absolutely do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we monitor. And, and, and so keep, keep in mind, there's a point source loading and there's non-point source loading. Point source loading is going to be directly from a pipe. It's going to be like a wastewater discharge, okay? And then there's non-point sources, and there's many different non-point sources that can be anything from stormwater runoff uh, to agriculture, 
to and there's there's lots of sources fertilizer for example you know over fertilization is going to cause a runoff it's going to be a nutrient source uh, but those all fall under the non-point source category um, in 1997 like the, the new nutrient strategy was adopted um, and there was a goal to us to, to for an, a 30 percent reduction in nitrogen loading to the new estuary um, it was a 30% reduction based on the mean of the, the total amount of nitrogen discharge between 1991 and 1995. That was, became the baseline, and then they wanted to uh, reduce it by 30% from there. Uh, so 30% so 30, 30 below the baseline. 30% below from the baseline. That's right, below the baseline. So in 2002, the Compliance Association um, was formed, the Noose River Compliance Association. It's uh, basically a sister association to the LNBA, many of the same members uh, and mostly point sources. Um, and, and so that Compliance Association was meant, uh, was formed so that trading could be accomplished, so that we could have group compliance. Uh, there was many benefits to that. Um, some of those benefits included uh, the time the time schedule in which plants could actually do their upgrades to get in compliance with the new with the nitrogen standard now that are the nitrogen um, levels that each plant or each point source discharge, discharge or greater than 0.5 mgd or million gallons per day uh, was issued an allocation and that's an annual loading amount in pounds um, so here you go. So 1.64 million pounds was that baseline that was established for, uh, for those point sources. Um, with a th with, to achieve the 30% reduction, um, all plants with existing discharges uh, had to meet a concentration of 3.7 milligrams per liter on an annual average basis at their total flow level. Okay, that's how, that's, the, that's how you do the calculation to establish the poundage that was issued to each of our discharge permits. Okay, um, also um, there were impacts on, on non-point sources. For example, new development, agriculture, and NCDOT were, had got mitigation requirements. Um, everybody had to try to mitigate, like Kenny discussed, their impacts. Um, so, but uh, the trading within the Noose River Compliance Association allowed for, um, also for transport factors. Uh, and that's a, that will be important going forward for how we use those transport factors. Um, to give you an example of what a transport factor is, we are in what's called the 50% transport factor. So what's assumed is that our, any, the, for every one pound that we discharge, half of that is reaching the estuary, okay? So, so we get a 50% transport factor out of that. Um, it goes a little different above the lake, and as you get closer to the coast, that transport factor decreases. Um, there was also a quarterly average total phosphorus concentration that was part of that TMDL uh, set at two milligrams per liter. But nitrogen is the primary, the primary culprit. Uh, there were new stormwater program requirements uh, that were the result of the uh, new nutrient st strategy. Um, riparian buffers um, were required, nutrient reductions for new development. Um, identification of illegal discharges at retrofit locations um, and mapping and reporting requirements were also established for stormwater programs. Now um, to, to look at that uh, the point source issue you can see the the orange line across the top represents that baseline of 1.64 million pounds per year. Um, what I want to show is what the Noose River Compliance Association has done as a group uh, against that, that baseline. You can see that uh, in the very beginning, uh, the dischargers, point source dischargers were well above the baseline, but that was, it actually went into effect in 2003. That rule went into effect for dischargers in 2003. So you can see by 2003, all of the point sources had gotten their act together and, and made major Im improvements in their plants, got significant reductions in their discharges, and have maintained that now for many years, since 2003. I want to show that also in a different form. This is uh, in the form of a concentration instead of a poundage, okay? So this is in a milligrams per liter. And, and the reason I'm showing you this, getting into this level of detail, is I just want to show, it was thought originally that the limit of technology for nitrogen removal, for total nitrogen, was about three milligrams per liter. 
Um, and so you can see in comparison to three milligrams per liter what the association's dis the point source dischargers have done. Mm -hmm. We're down average in, in the area of two and a half milligrams per liter. And we have many members, including us, who are lower than that. Okay. Good. The, um, the two places where it peaks up, where is there something that happened those times that made that rise like that? Uh, you know, that, that those are likely, if you, if you looked at hurricane events or some sort of storms, you would, you would probably find a tie to a storm event. Okay, thank okay. you. It could have. Uh, concentrations, concentration um, is, is just that. It's a concentration. Um, so it's, it's not, uh, so there's three things that go into calculating a poundage formula, right? You have 8.34 uh, pounds per gallon. You have a concentration of milligrams per liter, and you have a flow component. And so, if flow is very low but concentration is high, you could see you could see a little bit of a spike or, or a leveling. Um, but more than like more than likely, those those, those tied to some some type of weather event. Okay. It's been our, our numbers have been fairly consistent. Now, this is this is really important slide that we we need to spend just a minute on. Um, so we, we've been going through a master plan, wastewater master planning effort. Um, and our, our planning window right now is through about 2040. And so as we're looking at our allocation, that what we can discharge from the city um, and, and in terms of our, and, and comparing it to our growth projections, you, we, we correlate that to our flow projections and calculate where, where do we, how does our poundage change over time as we continue to go. And just by, and you can see that in the year 2033, 2034 timeframe, we actually bump up against our current allocation, okay? Um, so that's eye-opening. 2033, 2034 is well within our planning window, and uh, that's cause for concern, okay? Mm -hmm. So we are working to address that. Um, you can see this, this is our planning window. These are when we have uh, planned plant expansion space based on growth projections. We, we update these over time, um, but this is the current plan. And at each of these uh, milestones, you'll see at the 90 MGD design and permitting point and at the 105, we have an associated amount of total nitrogen allocation that we have to add uh, to our permits to be able to continue to grow and add, add this flow capacity, okay? Those are, those, are, those are critical. Now, how will we do that? What are our strategies for continuing to meet those? So uh, we're, we're constantly, so it seems like constantly, in this plant upgrade uh, uh, mode. And so we are always looking for improvements in technology that we can employ. We're always looking to oper uh, optimize our operation in terms of what we do. We've done a lot of that to date already to get to where, we're all, where we are. Um, a lot of that is, uh, you know, um, control systems, uh, automated control. We're doing a lot of that kind of stuff now. Um, but uh, we can also increase our allocation. There are some methods for increasing allocation, and we can do that by, by trading with other utilities. We can purchase nitrogen allocation from, from other utilities who hold nitrogen allocation. Problem is, they're not willing to sell it. Because uh, that, <laughs> that is their growth as well. That's their future. Um, uh, there are projects that can be done uh, to earn credits. Uh, Kenny talked a little bit about that. We can do mitigation projects to earn allocation that we can add to our, 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 to our, uh, our allocation. Um, the best of which is actually what we're finding is, is, is adding to, uh, taking agriculture out of agriculture, planting, uh, planting trees in, in buffers, streamed buffers, um, and uh, you know, increasing those buffers, um, but but by taking by taking that those those lands out of agriculture, you're actually removing that land's ability to be a contributing factor in terms of nutrients. Um, so there's a there's a there's a pretty good nitrogen to be earned from doing those kinds of projects. Um, and we can increase our flows to discharge to non discharge. What that means is less pipe or less water that goes flows out of, out of our pipe into the Noose River, and more water that we use in terms of reuse. Uh, we can do, you know, we we irrigate our fields uh, at the Noose River plant already, where we use a lot of water out there to irrigate our crops. Um, but we also irrigate golf courses um, and 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 lots of different uses uh, in our service area for that water. So, so the more we increase to, to reuse, the less we actually discharge. And so that's one way to offset.
mindset. There's also the direct and indirect potable reuse that I know you, you all are already familiar with. Um, how much of an impact does um, all of our development have in terms of, you know, is there, should we be doing more to prevent trees being cut down? Should we be doing more to limit impervious surface? Um, all of those play a part. Now, mm -hmm. certainly we're, we're doing mitigation to do those projects, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that that's really more of a policy kind of kind of direction. I I, I don't um, cer certainly the the more that you can limit that, the better. Um, but uh, there's you got it's a balance, right? Right, it's right. a balance. And to do those things that establish a credit that then could be banked mm -hmm. against our a lot of credits. Mm -hmm. So, for example, there are established credits for protecting buffers and going beyond the 50 feet on either side that's required to 200 feet. And there is a credit that could be established there. Uh, but there are other activities that currently do not have a credit. Urban forestation, for example, outside of the buffer does not have a credit. And we've worked pretty hard over the last couple of years to try to push for a credit to be established at the state level. Yeah, that would make, that seems like that. Yeah, but but isn't, isn't the problem though, is that as we continue to grow that the total nitrogen in the river is just going to keep going up. I mean, we, we can get the credits for sure, um, but but really we're just using those credits in order to discharge more nitrogen into the into the river. Uh, yeah, the, the credits, the way that you earn the credits are by doing projects that are intended to remove an equal amount of nitrogen on an ongoing basis. It should not be a one-time removal. The, those BMPs, best management practices, those types of things that you're doing, those buffers are intended to continue to remove nitrogen over time. Re remove it from the basin, from the Noose River, though. That's cr it's actually to prevent it from getting to the Noose River. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All so right, in so other words, we can put more nitrogen in, but somebody else cannot. Well, everybody has equal opportunity to do the same things in terms of getting the nitrogen credits. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's probably the best. We, we all we all have the same rules, the same work. rule book to play by. Right. Um, yeah. So, so also what we're doing, um, you know, we we have a contract today with Black and Veatch, a contract that you all approved, um, to to look at how we plan this, or what our plan is going forward in terms of nutrient mitigation. Um, and part of that, that work includes establishing wastewater flow projections. You've seen that with the chart we've already shown you. Um, but there's a, a property acquisition period. There's riparian restoration activities and credit release schedules tied with that work. Um, establishing credit reserves and sensitivity analysis to make sure that we're doing we're doing the best we can with the money that we're spending to do it, the, to making sure it's, it's the best use of the, of, the, of the city's funds. Now, to be more specific, uh, this is an example of the type of project that we're talking about and that we just referred to. This is the Noose River facility, uh, the city-owned uh, resource recovery facility located in southeast Raleigh. Uh, and you'll see on the fields that there are some highlighted kind of a pink purple kind of color around the buffers. Um, our, first, our first project uh, effort will be to increase the buffers on our own site. Uh, we can earn nitrogen credits without purchasing this land because we already own it. Um, so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna test the water um, and we're going to, to, to increase our buffers in our facility uh, and, and see and go through the process, earn some credits, add it, add to our allocation, see how that goes, and, um, and, and take what we learned and expand upon it going forward. So what, what can we do in terms of technology, though, in order to just reduce the amount of nitrogen that we discharge? So um, it's a good question. Um, I think there's work, there's work going on all the time. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that really the only way today to remove this, the best way to remove today is by, is a biological treatment process. And so you can only get so low. We're, we're actually getting into the low, high ones, low twos consistently right now um, with what we've done. I, I, and I think we're, we're a national leader in that area. Uh, what I would say about, um, you know, there is always the, have you heard of reverse osmosis? Mm -hmm. Reverse osmosis is a very, very high pressure, very expensive uh, uh, treatment methodology um, that really we should only use for drinking water if we ever need to do that, um, honestly. Um, that's about the only thing other than biological treatment that would reduce, reduce nitrogen. Okay, but as far as biological treatment is concerned, the effectiveness really depends on, drinking. on how much of it 
we have, uh, how large the facility is, and how much water we can treat using that methodology. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we will always have to grow the facilities to keep up with population growth. Um, to, yeah, and, 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 and it's not always about increased flows. Uh, you know, we see, we see lower flows actually a lot of the times, but we see higher concentrations. If we think about it in terms of lo loading, in terms of pounds instead of gallons, mm -hmm. um, we still see growth. We're seeing, still seeing significant growth on the treatment side. So yeah, it's, it's incumbent upon us to expand and grow and, and, and keep up with the growth of our service area. Then, um, then I think the thing that, it, the question in my mind then is, okay, what, how much could we rely on technology and how much do we have to grow these facilities uh, in order to meet certain goals and, and what would the cost be? And, uh, and so those, that would be something, information that I would be looking at. And I guess the question is, you know, 2034 is going to be here sooner than we would yes. like it to be. Yes, and, there, uh, there is... Um there is recent rules, uh, rule uh, and policy that we're working uh, with the state on. Um, uh, there is a, a current rule that requires that required uh, a two to one purchase where you would have to buy twice as much nitrogen as what you intended to add to your permit because of some uncertainty factors. We've been working with staff, we've been working with EMC, and a recent uh, ch uh, change has been proposed. It's being reduced from two to one to 1 1.5 to one. Um, but we can certainly provide you information with what, what that cost will look like. Okay. Yeah, we have that data. To, to add what TJ has shared, one of the better, more cost-effective ways to do this is to take uh, pollution from another contributor like agriculture and remove it from the system. That's right. mm -hmm. And we have been working together to find ways to uh, modify the regulatory framework to make that easier. So much so that our original cost estimates for the nitrogen we've got to acquire from uh, now to 2040 was almost $350 million. Mm -hmm. That number has dropped significantly because of those activities. And we're now able to target uh, contributors like agriculture and try to remove it there uh, instead of improving at an already limits of technology facility that TJ is managing. Okay. So in, to remove it from agriculture, does that mean that we are closing agriculture facilities or? Yeah. yeah. As, okay. as we, as we uh, establish those increased buffers, those buffered areas go into a permanent conservation easement. So they won't be used again for agriculture. So Kenny, in terms of working with our partners upstream, if we know how much we affect um, the estuaries, um, what kind of partnerships do we have with our upstream neighbors to help us um, mitigate as much as possible? Well, uh, TJ and uh, Dan work in the Lower Noose Basin, Noose River Compliance Association to address the estuary issues. Myself and Ben Brown work in the Upper Noose River Basin Association to address those very same issues in Falls Lake. And we're looking at these very same things. And we work together to expand the portfolio, for example, of credits. Uh, we've uh, helped establish an urban uh, repairing and buffer credit that didn't previously exist. That was um, a major effort led by the city of Raleigh, funded by the, our council. And there's a numerous other credits that have been established over the last nine years that didn't exist before mm -hmm. because of our collaborative efforts, both downstream and upstream. Okay. Mm -hmm. So good working relationship. Working We're very active. <laughs> um, that's all I have in terms of a presentation. If you have any other questions, we're happy to answer. No, not that. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Really well done. Thank you. So Mr. Stevenson has not made it back. And you just may want to be clear. I, I assume you want to report this out of committee with no report. We can no certainly report. share the PowerPoint in the record um, with your report out if, if you wish. Yes, uh, I think That'd so and make it available so that all the council members who if you want to know more about it, have the opportunity to do that. So we'll report that out to council. So we will hold 1726-2030 comp plan update to our next meeting so that we can have a fuller conversation with more of the committee here. Um, with all that said, we are adjourned. Thank you all.